On this episode of Narcissist Apocalypse Q&A, we talk about the manipulation tactics an abuser uses to gain control, isolate you, and erode your sense of self. Welcome to Narcissist Apocalypse Q&A, everyone. I am Brandon Chadwick, and today it's just me. It's just me by myself, and I hope everyone enjoys this episode. Today we are going to be discussing controlling manipulation and abuse tactics that erode oneself and how these tactics are built to question your reality and to isolate you. And I put together this document that I think eventually I'll be putting on our uh, website. And I think I put it all in, in the correct order. It's... um. It's an interesting kind of document to, to, to look at things, and I thought I, I'd share it with everyone today and help people uh, see things that maybe they weren't seeing and uh, understand why these tactics, uh, these controlling manipulation and abuse tactics are used, and uh, to give some examples throughout the whole entire uh, episode today as well. So... I want to thank everyone for listening, and I hope I, I, I do this justice. It's Doing an episode by yourself isn't uh, easy, and whoever does a, a podcast where it's just them, it's, it's not an easy thing to do, and kudos to whoever that is. I'm sure a lot of people listening have their own shows. So before I begin, if you want to be a guest on our Survivor Story show, please do go to NarcissistApocalypse.com. Top of the page, there's a button that says Guest Form. You click on that button, it takes you to our Guest Form page. There's a lot of instructions there, everyone. Read the instructions. Please read them all and then send me an outline, either through the form on the page by permit, by pressing the Submit button or send me an email at NarcissistApocalypse at gmail.com and put podcast guests in the subject line, and we will go from there. So first, when we talk about everything, when we talk about manipulation tactics, abuse tactics, uh, let's start off with defining what coercive control is. So coercive control is an act or a pattern of acts of assault, threats, humiliation, and intimidation, or other abuse that is used to harm, punish, or frighten the victim. The controlling behavior is designed to make a person dependent by isolating them, depriving them of independence, and regulating their everyday behavior. This can affect all areas of a partner's life, such as finances, careers, friendships, clothing choices, hobbies, medical care, food choices, and eating habits, etc., etc., things along those lines. And a lot of these can be slow builds or disguised as concern or cloaked in loving behaviors as well. We see a lot of that on the show. If you listen to our Survivor, or into our Survivor Story show, uh, I'm, I can't even get the words out of my mouth, everyone. If you listen to our Survivor Stories as well, you can hear a lot of these things and we point them out. So uh, just to continue here with co- Course of Control, no matter if these behaviors are overt or covert, the results of these behaviors are to lower the self-esteem of the partner and to isolate you from others and to give the abuser more control. So from here, how I started to look at things is where do you kind of move from course of control? So two things we kind of wanted to establish here were the use of fog, which is fear, obligation, and guilt. And then a technique that's kind called the divide and conquer technique. So uh, just to explain what the fog is first, uh, fear. So with Fear, abusers create fear. That fear can be that they will leave you, stop loving you. They can, if it's like work related, fire you. 
uh, there could be a fear of abandonment. There could be a fear of anger. You know, those are two of the most common and, and primal uh, fears that many of us hold right there. The fear of abandonment and, you know, the fear of like anger or something kind of uh, coming towards you. Obviously rage when we're discussing uh, stuff when it comes to abusers. Abusers will often engage these fears in others to get what they want. So fear for your safety, fear from rage, intimidation, uh, physical violence, verbal abuse, emotional abuse, stonewalling. The silent treatment can be used as fear tactics. These are a way to keep you in line and controlled. And we will go back to some of these things that we just stated just later on within the context of this document that I created. And up next, we have after fear, obligation. So we all have beliefs about how much we owe to others centered around ideals such as duty, obedience, loyalty, altruism, and self-sacrifice. These beliefs are necessary to form a moral foundation, but they can also become very unbalanced if we are not able to set and maintain healthy boundaries. So what abusers will do is exploit someone's sense of obligation by overemphasizing how much we owe them, how much they have given up and how much they have done for you. They create an argument that is, it is our responsibility to meet their requests. And this can sound like a good daughter would spend time with their mother. Uh, I work my ass off for this family. Things along those lines. So obviously someone does something for you and then you might be uh, feel obligated that you have to do something back for them as well. So that is obligation. And then there is guilt, which is the G in the fog. And most of us feel guilt. So when we do something that we think hurts someone else or disappoints others, we feel guilt. It's just natural inside all of us. But abusers will use blame and accusation to create feelings of guilt inside of us. So when it comes to guilt, an abuser will, it's all about creating that feeling that we've done something wrong to hurt them or that some mistake that has happened uh, might be our fault. And sometimes they make up that mistake. Sometimes, you know, they'll blame you for things that didn't happen and you might believe those things. And all of a sudden you feel guilt upon something that didn't even occur. So some examples of guilt, the silent treatment is a form of guilt, uh, listing every favor they've ever performed for you, which probably isn't a lot, but that is a form of guilt. Things like, uh, I do things for you all the time might come out of their mouth. Um, and then you know, sometimes there's something very, some very direct ways of someone to make you feel guilty. And that's by just telling them all the things that they've done wrong. And that can make someone feel guilty. And, uh, there's a couple different types of guilt. There's moral guilt and moral guilt is, you know, saying something along the lines of, you're going out with your friends and maybe you're going to the casino or something like that. And you're choosing that over uh, doing anything with me and staying with me. Wouldn't you rather stay home with me? That's a moral guilt. And then there's sympathy seeking type of guilt. And that type of guilt is when someone will talk at length about the other person's behavior and how it has hurt them. And then you get that type of guilt as well. So those are the three things in the fog. Fear, obligation, and guilt, which is part of coercive control, which is part of how someone, an abuser, can you know, really start controlling you and get you to do what they want. And these are a real big chunk of the, of the tactics that are used, and a lot of offshoots can come from this. And then there is also 
something called divide and conquer. And divide and conquer is really a, a way to gain control, but also isolate you. And a divide and conquer technique is, you know, it's used to gain power, gain control, to isolate you from support, isolate you from people, from reality, to gaslight, to distort your reality, your beliefs, your values, your opinions. This is where you hear flying monkeys a lot. You know, smear campaigns are here in the divide and conquer, conquer area. So like flying monkeys for the abusers, and, you know, they start playing people off uh, or against each other to cause chaos between people and to plant seeds of self-doubt in your mind, other people's minds, and to really get you to question if you are enough. And, you know, eventually we'll talk about triangulation and, and all those things, but the divide and conquer is really a technique to sow the seeds of doubt within you, uh, others against you, and really start to isolate you and have you on an island by yourself. And this can separate you from everyone you know, and all of a sudden, all that is left for you to talk to is your actual abuser, and you don't know what's safe, who's safe, nothing is safe at this point. So that is the divide and conquer and a lot of the ways to get the fog to happen, to have the divide and conquer work is, um, you know, to gaslight someone and, and gaslighting everyone is a form of manipulation where an abuser denies, uh, provides conflicting information or outright lies over and over again in direct contradiction to what an other person can blatantly perceive using their own five senses. And this is taken from the movie Gaslight. So there's a movie from uh, 1944. It's a movie called Gaslight, where a man purposely tries to drive his wife insane by making the gaslights flicker, then telling her that she's imagining it and when she starts pointing it out. And that is done so the person begins to doubt their uh, own perception of reality. And, you know, that you'll see that. You see a lot of people these days you know, saying that someone is gaslighting them. You know, this is what it means. It's about seeing knowing what you're seeing or sensing and someone telling you that that is not the reality, even though you know it's true until the point where eventually um, the tactics in which they use to gaslight you work. And some forms of gaslighting, um, let's just start here with the letter A. The way I kind of did everything at the beginning when I was making this document, you know, the top of the, my, my list was accusations. And accusations, sometimes people might call these projections. Not all of them, I would say, are projections. But accus accusations are the first thing on my list. And there are a bunch of different types of accusations. And accusations, they are meant to have you on the defensive. So you conform to the desired outcome or for you to self-regulate these behaviors in the future. So accusations may also be used as a swerve, and that's where I wrote down here projection, so you don't see your partner doing the same thing. And an example of that is cheating. Someone is going to um, say to you, hey, you're cheating, and it makes you look at yourself and not what's going on there, and they're actually the ones that are, are doing it. And accusations can also be used as a way to isolate you. And that is, uh, for an example, uh, accusing you of sleeping with a family member. And now we're going to get into both the accusation uh, of cheating in, and sleeping with family members because we hear this a lot on our show. So accusing you of cheating as this gaslighting technique. So when you are accused of cheating, you start to self-regulate your own behavior uh, around others. So your partner won't rage. You might stop going out with your friends just in case you could be accused. It's isolating, especially if they accuse you of sleeping with a friend or coworkers. And it doesn't matter if they're the same gender as you or not. They can do it about anything. 
So these things are kind of done here to isolate you in this sense of making you kind of stay away from your friends or, or maybe, you know, not going out with them at all. You start to self-regulate. You start to stay in. You don't even want to get in these situations to begin with because they might start raging or the jealousy could come out. So that's how that forms. But it can also be done so you really don't know what's going on in their life. And I say this because when someone starts accusing you of something, the focus is on you. You start to defend you. You start to really start to prove that maybe you didn't do these things. So the focus then completely leaves them in any way. And, you know, the psychology of that is that you don't look into what they're doing in their life. You know, everything's on your side of the table. You don't even have time to go to their side of the table to be like, well, what's going on when I'm not around you? So it's really done as like it's a projection. It's a swerve. So accusing of cheating can be done for the isolation aspect of things, but also to hide what's going on and to really start controlling your um, movements and whereabouts and controlling how you are acting and really have you in line. So another form of accusation is accusing you of sleeping with family members. And to me, this is a really insidious form of control in isolation tactic because all of a sudden you start to feel uncomfortable around a family member. Could be your dad, could be your brother, could be your sister. Uh, It could be anyone within that family. And that makes you start to distance yourself uh, from those people, uh, even though it isn't true. And you really then start, a lot of people, when we listen to these stories, they start to really, what's the best way to put it? They start to really start questioning or watching their movements in front of their family members and also how their family members are are interacting with them and they then might not like to be touched by those family members. A lot of the times we hear the word icky being used and it's really insidious because all of a sudden you are distrusting uh, your family members. You're being isolated at the same time and it makes you, well, it makes it really hard to confide in anyone because at that point you don't know, you don't want to bring this up to anyone that this is what's being said you know, so you start to believe like maybe they maybe they do touch me a little bit more than they should. And when those things start creeping in, you know, you start to really self-isolate yourself and you start to really conform and hanging around these people a lot less. And that's and it's really dangerous and it's a really insidious form of accusation and control. And up next on our list here. Uh, We have blame shifting. So an abuser sometimes cannot take blame for things that have happened because that would require them to view themselves as individuals capable of making mistakes. So even when they are to blame for something and the evidence is staring them right in the face, uh, they begin to think that someone will blame them for an action. So they go into a self-preservation mode and will deflect all blame from themselves and, uh, onto somebody else uh, or, or some other situation. And this can sound like if you wouldn't have said that, then I wouldn't have called you names. Or if you weren't always nagging me, then I wouldn't have cheated on you. If you didn't always make me angry, then I wouldn't hit you. So those are kind of things that you might hear coming from blame shifting, where they're taking the focus off of the thing that they did wrong and start to stick it on to you. And an offshoot of blame shifting I have here is minimizing. And minimizing entails acknowledging that They may have done something harmful, but they refuse to take responsibility for the level of abusive behavior and the level of harm caused. And they'll say things like, it wasn't that bad. Get over it. And in that case, you might start feeling 
uh, something along the lines of you might be feeling guilty. You might be feeling self in indulgent for for thinking that after something is said something like that is said so you know when these things happen you really begin to doubt yourself these things are this minimizing makes you start to question what has actually happened and if it is that bad and 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 that is a tactic right there that erodes your sense of self and it's a really big tactic tactic and uh, an offshoot or part of this tactic can sometimes be rationalization. So rationalization is similar to minimizing. So people who use power and control to get uh, their way will use reasoning and rationalization. They'll rationalize by saying things like, I only did it one time. Yet in actual fact, they are using controlling tactics daily, weekly, monthly, all the time. It's done in an ongoing way over a long period of time. So they rationalize by saying that one behavior they did a moment ago was a one-off, or they'll minimize that in a, in a really incessant pattern. It's an ongoing pattern of control across time. And it gets really confusing at this point. And again... This rationalization is used to really erode your sense of self and who you are as a person. You know, it it can be very clever because there's a logic to what they say. At the time, there isn't an argument against it because these things can actually make sense. It's not till you go away afterwards where you think about, hey, like that really wasn't Right. So the controlling partner will rationalize by reminding you of all the times you did something wrong and when they did something right as well. That happens a lot. So uh, they'll also compare your behaviors, saying that you might have it so much better than your friend or someone in the news. Uh, And maybe in, in comparison to that, your relationship could be great. So it really starts to rationalize their bad behavior in a comparison to something else, you know, and uh, that can, even in the most simplest forms, when you think about uh, when you're a child and you might be getting abused by a parent and they, that parent might say, Hey, um, kids over in these third world countries have way harder than you. You have nothing to complain about. And Technically, in your mind, you can rationalize that saying, yeah, I understand that. I get it. And you, and in that way, the rationalization minimizes your actual experience. So, you know, these comparisons can happen um, even when physical violence is not part of the relationship at all. So, you know, just so everyone eh, to reiterate here, this is done to erode your sense of self. And another one within this category is uh, justification. So when a controlling person justifies their behaviors, they usually turn the attention onto the victim, saying that they would not have behaved that way if they had done what was expected of them. So you were supposed to keep the children quiet and you didn't do it. So this is what happened. Uh, You were supposed to have dinner on the the table at the time. And because you didn't do that, this is what happened. Um, So these are ways for them to justify. They'll they'll try and come up with something that maybe you didn't do. That is a truth. That is an actual truth. And then they'll take that little truth and justify their behavior because of it. And that truth may not even be a big thing at all, at all, but they put the truth in there. And that brings us to the kernels of truth, because this is all really confusing. You know, this is all done to twist you around, to make you think you're going crazy. And kernels of truth you know, the definition here would be like a core accuracy at the heart of a claim or narrative, which also contains dubious or fictitious elements. And this can play a lot in defensive abuse or reactive abuse when someone is reacting to someone. 
and or or for that to be used against them. So it can be done, you know, remember when that time you hit me was and like wasn't that terrible of you. And yeah, that was terrible if I hit that person, but you never saw what preceded that hitting. And you never saw maybe that the, they might have poked you first or other, you know, this is, I'm saying this in generalization of like other people seeing this, but everything that led up to the defensive abuse. Remember that time you ripped the door off his hinges and threw it in my direction? Well, something the other person did led them up to that point. And they'll bring that little point up. So there's a truth. You can grab that truth, but they wrap it in the lie as if nothing they did previous was there and make you out to be the bad person and you believe it. And this happens in so many situations. So, you know, uh, and just to explain reactive abuse is, uh, or defensive abuse, it's pushing you to the point where you fight back. Uh, many times they do this and they might audio record you. They'll visually record you. So they even have proof that these things happen, but they might only put on that video or that audio right in time for what you want to see. And they'll flash that back in your face. And that can really have you twisted around as well. And again, it erodes your, uh, uh, self-esteem. It erodes everything about your identity and really picks you apart. And that gets us to identity erosion. So identity erosion is when you attack the beliefs of yourself. So if you are someone that's helpful, someone might then try to attack your helpfulness. If you think that you are competent, your abuser might start to attack your competency, these core things of your identity. Uh, I'm, I consider myself to be reliable. Like my identity is in that like space. So if someone was to attack my reliability, that's something that I actually might fight back against other things. Someone could say to me and it won't hurt me in any sort of way. I won't fight back or I won't, it won't erode my identity. But when you're attacking someone's core beliefs of who they are, it has a really, a uh, strong impact and to really identify what your core beliefs of yourself are, of your identity are, and to really in the healing aspect of, of, of getting those beliefs back about yourself and understanding, you know, why abuse tactics worked against me, which ones worked. A lot of them go into your core beliefs, your belief systems and things along those lines, which we try to sh showcase in, the, in our survivor story shows uh, as much as possible. So going back to the core beliefs, they will, an abuser will attack that core belief because they want to take that core belief about you away from you. It takes your worth and identity and it puts it into their hands. So if you want that core identity of who you are to be recognized and to feel it, you'd have to then get it from them once your worth is in their hands. And that's when they can really push and pull and really twist you around and, and have you do whatever you want because they are holding all the cards at this point in the situation because they have such effect on your worth and your identity in these situations. And an offshoot of identity erosion can be your belief systems and specifically religion. So religious beliefs, using religious beliefs against you, you know, things like honor thy mother and father, honor thy husband, uh, using guilt and shame as a way to control, uh, claiming to speak on behalf of God, uh, you know, using the Bible to justify uh, uh, abuse. So. For people who have strong religious beliefs, uh, in this sense, it, that can be a big identity erosion, and it's something that an abuser, specifically a religious or spiritual abuser, can can really uh, grab onto and control you and, and isolate you from, from everyone. So that brings us to another form of eroding self or just to question things, this form of like gaslighting. And that would just be nitpicking. 
And nitpicking is pretty simple. It's really straightforward. And it's the pointing out of flaws, mistakes, and just ways to criticize. And it's just a constant with nitpicking. It could be your hair. It could be your weight. It could be uh, uh, not just the way you look. It, it can also, that goes into the competency things. The nitpicking can get into the identity erosion. Uh, these are straightforward little tactics kind of being used. And it's a constant. And it's a constant and it wears you down. And eventually... Once it's done enough, uh, you know, you start to, again, the, these doubts, like, do I really look like this? Am I like this? It, you know, nitpicking is a way that, you know, identity erosion uh, can happen. And next on my list here is hidden or covert tactics. And... Hidden O or covert tactics, I have a few things on here. And these are things that are confusing for people when it comes to gaslighting, when it comes to control manipulation. And the first one on my list I have is control disguised as love. And we hear this on the show a lot. And that is when someone is asking or worrying about where you've been, texting for uh, safety reasons, things along those lines, where you think that it's really like out of your concern, uh, out of concern for your safety, your whereabouts. You don't want them being in the wrong side of town at a certain night. So you really start to kind of check in and you're doing all these check-ins and, and you don't realize that that's a form of control. And it's just done under the guise of, you know, someone actually caring about you or for the safety of you. And in reality, that's what it, 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 it's meant to look like. But the reality of the situation is that over a long period of time, you will be actually be able to see that uh, eventually you're going to be checking in and doing all of these things before they even ask you. And you're self-regulating yourself. And this kind of stuff, because it will happen so much, could then isolate you from even going out in the first place because it just happens so often and, and jealousy starts to rear its ugly head. And up next, we have honesty after admitting misdeeds. So this will be something like, well... That your partner comes up to you and says that they uh, cheated or you confront them and they say that they cheated. They outright admit that they cheated. And because that they admit that they cheated, they want to be given um, recognition for being trustworthy. And then you start to see them as being trustworthy and it all becomes... Uh, you know, a different kind of story. All of a sudden you start to forget that they cheated on you because they admitted to doing it. So if they admitted to doing it, then they must be trustworthy and you start to believe that they are trustworthy and everything about them cheating is completely forgotten. So that's something that is under honesty after admitting misdeeds. And this can be done probably the same for, you know, someone uh, you stole from me, but I came and I admitted that I stole for it. I was wrong for it. Like I admitted that I did it. And, and again, once again, you are looking at the admission of it and taking, re not taking responsibility. It's more of a, a trustworthy um, swerve tactic. And you are not really looking at the misdeed that occurred before, but you're going to see them as being a trustworthy person. And again, this is a form of gaslighting. You know, you're seeing what you're seeing, but you're being told it's something completely different. And then another one that we've heard before on the show for a hidden or covert tactics is rage disguised as passion. And this is a difficult one. And two things about this. Passion is constructive. Rage is destructive. So just remember that about passion and rage. Passion is trying to build something. Rage is about kind of breaking things. So those are the two dis distinctions. So sometimes people get confused when they're in these relationships and the person says, I'm passionate about something. I'm passionate about something. And you fall in love with that passion. 
but in reality, it's a rage. They're raging. And so when rage does occur later on, it becomes really confusing because you're seeing that this feeling that they're showing you is supposed to be, I'm quote, air quoting here, passionate, but it's not. It's a rage and it's confusing and it's a form of gaslighting and that in itself um, can twist you around. As I've said many times in this episode, I think I've said twist it around uh, at least 10 times and that can have uh, huge effects uh, when it then comes to control and really eroding your identity eventually as well. So earlier on, we discussed the fog. And we mentioned a bunch of different things within the fog. And one of the things is fear. So types of, I guess, little tiny tactics within the fear category and things within this realm are stonewalling, which is the refusal to engage in a conversation or provide information or other resources as a form of punishment for bringing up talk, topics that an abuser doesn't like. Stonewalling can happen. And that is, uh, you know, a fear of abandonment can, can really click in right here. This person might be leaving me. And all of a sudden, boundaries of where you are, where the other person is, you might start jumping over that boundary line, thinking that you need to get them back. What is going on? Which makes you feel like you're going crazy. And that's why it's it's done. And it's made to be... You know, and that can be taken in, in a million different ways after by the abuser because at this point, if you're reacting to that, they can start pointing out to those reactions. And as we stated before, uh, reactive abuse, you know, all of a sudden there's a kernel of truth that might be going on where everything that preceded it isn't shown and you start to believe the lies possibly of what's going on. Again, as I said many times before, twists you around. And some examples of stonewalling are abruptly walking away, avoiding eye contact, uh, acting busy or abruptly moving to another task, minimizing your concerns is a big one, um, defensive communication, uh, avoiding conversations about the problem, refusing to answer any questions, uh, deflecting and placing blame, ignoring you, or even pretending not to hear you at all is a big one. But I guess the biggest one is the silent treatment. The silent treatment is a form of punishment that many emotional abusers use. It's a way for them to take your power away. So now the only way for you to gain their acceptance or forgiveness is to do what they say. So when you love your partner and you want to bring your relationship back to a good place, you'll likely do what they want. So that you see all the time. Other things in here in the fear category, threats. Threats are used a lot, puts fear in you. Physical abuse, intimidation. And intimidation can be done, you know, very subtly. Um, it doesn't just always have to be done um, in a way where the, you know, a body gets put in the way. It's in the physical, like, abuse might not happen. It might just be the way they're standing in front of you. Uh, I heard a story recently, which I think we'll probably be recording, where a gun was always placed somewhere in the open. It might not have been in anyone's hands at all, but it was there. Things like that. That's intimidation. So next up, we have different types of arguments, kind of like crazy circular conversation arguments. And we have two on our list here. Uh, one is a word salad, which is a circular type of argument, which is a crazy making uh, argument in the sense of you're keeping on going around. It's a, a lot of gaslighting going on inside it. And then we have in here sleep deprivation because a lot of times with sleep deprivation, you're being woken up as well in the middle of the night. Your sleep is being disrupted, but you're put into circular conversations when you don't know what's going on. Again, uh, these things do erode um, you know, your sense of self uh, of what's real and what's not real and uh, keeps you on edge. So let's first start off with uh, the word salad. 
violence, which is circular language where abusers use it to ensure conversations will never have a satisfactory end. These are things you don't want to be in. You fear having them. You're afraid in them. They just continue and go and go and go. Very confusing. And then uh, sleep dep- deprivation is a, is another one, which is part of the arguments. And not allowing you to go to sleep or you maybe you've gone to sleep and then they get you up in the middle of the night. They start to do that. It's part of um, the thing that a lot of the time they'll wake you up and they'll start an argument with you within that pattern. So they're getting you up to start an argument. It creates fear. It's a really sinister type of abuse as well. It has short-term effects, long-term effects on, sorry, long-term effects on a survivor's health and you're denied sleep. And this has a really big impact on your life. It can uh, have depression uh, aspects to it, hopelessness, and even a sense of uh, losing your mind as possible consequences. So arguments are a really big thing. And it's something that everyone wants to avoid. You fear them happening, you know, because a lot of these arguments, rage occurs in it as well. And then after that, we talked a lot earlier um, about things like triangulation and things like that. So there, there, there are aspects of control and isolation where uh, other people get involved in these situations, and that is never fun. And and one of them is smear campaigns, and that is a lot of you have experienced a smear campaign, and that's to really guard against exposure, prepare for an exit from the relationship to gain sympathy from others. Abusers may spread gossip or tell a half truths or outright lies about you um, to other people uh, behind your backs, preparing that they're starting to sow the seeds of doubt against you. And it's a very difficult thing for everyone to go through. And then we have triangulation. And triangulation is a manipulation tactic used to avoid a direct conversation, just as the name suggests. And it involves three parties. And it's used to deflect some tension. Uh, It creates uh, another conflict to take the spotlight off of the original issue sometimes. And then sometimes it reinforces the sense of rightness or superiority of the person that is going about it. And sometimes these things look like a conversation like this. Someone might say, um, someone might actually... uh, Sorry. And sometimes it will look uh, different. Like the person doesn't have to actually be uh, in the room with you. Not all three people have to be in the same place as once. So someone might show their phone to show a picture of their last partner. And maybe might, that partner might be nude in it. And, they, and, they, and the person might say, they keep sending me photos saying that they want me back. And then they look at the photo for a long period of time and then at you and then uh, back at the photo And they might then say, honestly, I'm not sure why we broke up anymore. And they then might say, we had the wildest sex and like how good looking they were. And so that's a form of triangulation that you might not think that other person might not even know that they're part of the triangulation. Uh, Other ones, uh, the abuser might call your mother and complain how badly you're mistreating them or being unfair in order for you to be reprimanded uh, by by the mom later. Um, Then they might bring in a platonic friend into one of your arguments, asking that friend to choose a side, which is usually their side because they've influenced the situation uh, beforehand or during that conversation. They know what they're doing. They know how to charm they're they're good at what they do. And as a result, you feel insecure. You begin to worry that they'll leave you uh, in a lot of these cases. Uh, and then you might work harder to accommodate their needs, uh, their desires in order to earn similar praise of what is going on with these other people or just kind of fall in line with what is being said or reinforced in these situations. And then that moves us on to flying monkeys. And these are people like uh, friends, family, exes, other people in their lives that you may not know about at all. They're part of the fan club of the abuser, and they do a lot of the bidding for the abuser uh, because a lot of the time they are blindly uh, hidden by their charms. 
Uh, they don't know that they're, you know, part of the uh, problem here. They actually might really think good things of this person. They just can't see it yet. A lot of times they'll never see it. And again, you're being isolated from people. You have no one to talk to at that point. It puts you into a situation where you think you're going crazy. Uh, flying monkeys come in a lot of times when you're trying to be hoovered back or they're trying to get you back. And, you know, then we bring up a lot of things here. They try to minimize what's going on. Uh, they try to rationalize what's done. They try to justify things that are done on behalf of this person. And they really lay on all of um, what the... Uh, abuser can't get through themselves, but you know some of these people you might respect, and they might be the ones to draw you back in. And again, it's all a form of control. So that is it. That is on my list, and I think it's an interesting list to kind of go through as far as manipulation tactics, uh, how it can erode your sense of self, how it can erode your identity, and the little things in between within those subjects that can be used uh, against you. So uh, I hope everyone enjoyed this episode. And I uh, really want to thank you, uh, everyone, for listening. This is the first time I have uh, done an episode by myself. It, it's not easy, actually. It's so much easier having someone uh, with you to go back and forth. So hopefully uh, I did this subject uh, justice and uh, I just want to thank everyone for listening today. And again, if you want to be a guest on our Survivor Story episode, uh, please go to NarcissistApocalypse.com. Top of the page, there's a button that says Guest Form. When you click on that button, it takes you to our Guest Form page. Read all the instructions and send us an email to NarcissistApocalypse at gmail.com. Or, sorry, not or, and I've been talking way too much and for way too long. <laughs> and you can also go to our website to go to join our support group at NarcissistApocalypse.com. Top of the page, there's a button that says support group. Click on that. It takes you to our safe social network. On there, we have our very own forum boards. We have Zoom meetings every Wednesday night, every Saturday night, and every other Thursday afternoon. We have episodes that never made it to air and follow-up episodes with guests on there here or there, as well as ad-free episodes. And if you just want to support the show, please do go and join our support group. And last thing, if you want even more support, please do go to our friends at domesticshelters.org. If you need to find information on a shelter, they have it there. They have articles and resources for you as well. Everything there is free. There are wonderful art articles on there. So please do go to domesticshelters.org today. And that is it. So for myself and myself today, I hope you have a good night.